Good evening, everyone. We, like, we would like to welcome everyone to this meeting of the Neighborhood and Community Development Standing Committee. Public comment is welcome. Anyone wishing to speak on any item on the Standing Committee agenda may do so when that item is up for discussion. We would ask you to come up to the podium if you wish to speak, be recognized by myself, and then you'll have five minutes to make your comments. For accurate recording and broadcasting purposes, we do ask that everyone present please speak as directly as possible into a microphone tonight. Roll call, please. Roll call. Walters? Here. Mergia? Here. Townsend? Here. McKiernan? Here. Thank you very much. Our first item of business tonight is uh, approval of the minutes of the March 3rd, 2014 Standing Committee meeting. So, so moved. There is a motion. Second. And there is a second. All in favor of approving the minutes from March 3rd say aye. 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 All opposed say no. The ayes have it. The minutes are approved. Excuse me, Mr. McCarran. Did the outlets on the tables not work? I don't. What a good question. I don't know. The outlets on the tables. Because I can't get to I would assume down. that they are because we've got power taped down to the. How about try this one? That's right. Good Lord. Okay. How are we doing now? No. That would be no. We have no power. Come on over it. We'll just take a moment here and, and solve this problem because... Somebody has a hard copy. I could use that. But I have brought my agenda on here and I'm out of battery. Is it not plugged in back to the wall? Is there a... Uh -huh. Wait a minute. Excuse me while I dive under this chair. Can we get the camera? What? Okay. Then we'll there. Now we're set. It should be on now. Good job. <laughs> plug it in. <laughs> what a concept. Yeah. Great. When all else fails, check the plug. Yes. Thank you. All right. Now we're up to item number one on the committee agenda, and that is land bank applications. Mr. Slaughter. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, short and sweet tonight, we have 12 applications. 11 of those are for yard extension, and one is for parking. Uh, if you'd like, I can go through the addresses for you. 423. Well, since we, since we had the addresses and all the applications in our agenda packet, I would just ask if there's any questions or any um, discussion about any of these properties. Commissioner Townsend? Thank you. Um, I have a disclosure with regard to the application for Trinity AME Church. I am a member of that church. Uh, I do not hold any position in the church uh, as an officer, trustee, no um, position of fiduciary responsibility, and I have no substantial financial interest in it. Um, I had posed the question to Councillor Bolding if I can even vote tonight on that, um, given the disclosure I just made. And because I was informed we need, my vote would be needed for a quorum, I did want to make that disclosure uh, before we got further into the process. And we don't have a sufficient, I mean, there's not a conflict here? No, I yeah. don't because of the lack of um, substantial financial interest. Excellent. I think she's allowed to vote. And um, if she would want to abstain at the full commission, um, this would at least advance it. Beautiful. Thank you. Commissioner Walters. I have a question <coughs> for you, Chris. Um, if you could just kind of explain the number of lots that are being awarded to Mr. Flores and the fact that there are so many that are side by side but they're all called yard extensions and especially maybe the one that's across the street that's being called a yard extension. I didn't know if that was that, That's practice. probably a very liberal interpretation of yard extension uh, but there's really no other improvements, houses in that area. Um, it's prop definitely probably I would never be interested in buying, but Mr. Flores has expressed his interest. He um, does have a home there. He, he feels he'd like to expand. Um, it, it, they are generally pretty heavily wooded, but he um, 
you know, in a conversation I had, he, he just really expressed a strong interest in the properties. Um, again, don't really know how many other people are going to come for these. I think they've been in the land bank for some time, and I have never received an application on them in the past. So that's pretty much why they're being presented now. Uh, the one that's across the street, uh, has there been any conversation with the adjacent property owners about whether they would be interested as opposed to someone who is remote? I'm the, the two on 18th Street? Uh, yes, specifically, I think, it's 1650 South 18. Yeah. Um, if I remember right from what the way the, way the map showed, um, it, it's not like it's they're they're butting up back to back to each other. Um, I mean, it's almost like they're on 18 Street, but I don't. I can't even recall if it's even a completed street or a, a thoroughfare. I mean, again, this is all heavily wooded <coughs> property. Um, there, there were houses in the area, but I don't believe any of them were adjacent to this, that there was other further property. In fact, there was three more land bank properties that I tried to throw in on the deal that he, you know, at least didn't express at this time would okay. be something that he was interested in. Thank you. Move for approval. Second. There's a motion to approve all of the land bank transfers as indicated and a second. Any further discussion? Hearing none, roll call please. Roll call. Walters? Aye. Mergia? Aye. Townsend? Aye. McKiernan? Aye. Thank you. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. That actually concludes our committee agenda tonight and now we move to our public agenda. The only item on the public agenda is an appearance by uh, Ms. Erin Stryka who will, is bringing forward tonight, and if you could come on up, come on up to where Mr. Slo, come on all the way up to the table here. It'll just be more convenient for, for you. Beautiful. And she comes with some proposed changes to the ordinance that governs the keeping of backyard hens. Hi, uh, my name's Erin Stryka. Thank you so much for having me. I actually want to start by reading a story from a community member that first brought us this issue. Uh, Pamela Garcia is a Rosedalian who came to us about a year ago, and this is the story that she told us then. In 2008, my life changed. My daughter, Julianne, then 11, was diagnosed with idiopathic pulmonary hypertension. During this time, the community surrounded us with love, prayer, and assistance in many forms. We felt humbled and treasured at our greatest hour of need. I will never forget what it felt like to be helped by so many. Julianne's diagnosis qualified her for the Make-A-Wish Foundation. Initially, she wished to meet Arnold Schwarzenegger in person, but ultimately decided to donate her wish to the guardian angels and uplift. Through the donation, our family began to volunteer at the pantry, allowing us to see the need in the community for healthy food firsthand. Adapting to our new life and reflecting on our experiences, my mind ran rampant on how to provide for my family. Gardening has always been a hobby of mine, and I realized it could also benefit my family and community through the production of healthy, accessible food. As I learned more about gardening, I discovered that backyard hens would be a perfect addition to the garden. Hens eat bugs, eliminating the need for toxic sprays. Hen manure can be composted into fertilizer for the garden, and we would all benefit from healthier eggs. In order to get healthier and more affordable food for a family, Pamela applied for a permit to keep hens in her backyard and was told that she couldn't have one because essentially her backyard was too small. The current regulations say that to keep hens, your hens have to be 100 feet away from the nearest occupied building and 25 feet from your property line. And my backyard is not that big and neither is Pamela's. So we did a lot of research. We talked to a lot of community members and we read the keeping regulations in the city code of ordinances over and over and over and came up with two changes that we think need to happen. The first is to amend the distance that your hens have to be from the nearest occupied structure and from your property line. And then there are several 
tweaks that we'd like to recommend that will more encourage responsible hen keeping. You have in front of you our current regulations and also a document called Recommendations for Amending Keeping Regulations. Um, and if you will, don't mind, I'll just go through these point by point. Um, the first section, we require people to get a permit for hens, which we think is fantastic. We want to keep that, but would actually like to strengthen the permit process to say that you won't be issued a permit if you haven't been paying your property taxes or if you have outstanding codes violations. We want to make sure that people we give the permit to are good, responsible neighbors. We also want to say that when you get a permit, you'll also get information on responsible hen keeping and contact information for people who can help you. Second, we'd like to shrink the distance that your hens need to be kept from the nearest occupied structure from 100 feet to 25 feet. Um, 25 feet is actually a really significant distance and is very much enough for hens not to be any sense. I will show you if you'd like. Um, no. No? Okay. <laughs> I would. I'd you want to see? Yeah. Yeah. Get your assistance here. That's the whole length of this thing. Just head for the back. Um, we're saying 25 feet from the nearest occupied structure, 10 feet from your property line. Oh. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Had anyone doing stuff? No. Uh, the third was actually a suggestion from our commissioner. Um, that the section on maintenance of enclosures for fowl says that enclosures should be limed every three months, which is good, but not necessary unless you have quite a few fowl. So we're adding in there 20 or more fowl. Um, next, and this is a really important one, um, we have a really good ordinance saying you have to keep your hen enclosure clean and not smelly, but it is missing asking people to submit a vermin control plan with their application. So we're suggesting adding in that um, and a suggestion that they use bait boxes to safely get rid of vermin. You're also required to allow um, the UG to inspect your hen enclosure. We're of adding a suggestion that inspections be conducted every three years and at that three-year interval we also check to make sure you're still paying your taxes you still don't have codes violations finally there's a provision in there now saying if somebody builds their structure within that distance to your hen enclosure that you have to then pick them up and move them or get rid of them i don't think that's likely to be an issue with the smaller setbacks but even if it is, um, it just seems sort of unfair that you would be using hens to feed your family and then have to move it because somebody built there. So we're suggesting removing that. Um, so all of this is with the hope of making an ordinance that more strongly requires people to keep hens responsibly, cleanly, safely, and also will allow more families like Pamela's to get access to eggs living in Wyandotte County. And Gordon, check me on this and see, because I would imagine that our flow here would be that Aaron brings this forward. We have a discussion. Effectively, instead of the ordinance coming to us, the proposed ordinance comes to us. We can have the discussion now. Forward recommendations to, I would assume, planning and zoning is the keeper of this ordinance. Yes. That we would forward that to planning and zoning. They would review it and come back maybe with any questions, comments, concerns, additions, deletions that they might have and that it would circle back to us or potentially go to full commission if the ordinance change is agreeable to all. Right. So is that kind of the trajectory we're on here? So in that case, what I'd say is we have an opportunity, and I know that our agenda says that we're, it's a five-minute discussion, but I'd say at this point in time, let's have the discussion about the proposed ordinance changes. If there are any questions, if there's any discussion that anybody on the committee wants to have about that so that possibly it could go to planning and zoning with recommendations of support for whatever we come up with here. So I'll open it for any questions or discussion that members of the committee might like to have. I just have a comment and I, I will wait for staff's review but it seems like reducing the requirement from 100 feet to 25 feet is a drastic reduction. So I would like to specifically request staff to advise us as to why it was 100 feet in the first place and if 
it really didn't need to be 100 feet, and now we think it only needs to be 25 feet, what the basis is for that. And I'd be curious also to know how many complaints we've gotten uh, regarding proximity of hens uh, under the current ordinance. And so what's been the history of those? How have they been resolved? What recommendations do staff have in relation to any complaints we might have received? And then I had a, a question about inspections. I think it's, it's cool that we would uh, conduct, conduct inspections every three years at a minimum. We don't do that now? We don't inspect now? Or we do? We don't. It depends on how your permit is issued. Um, I have backyard hens. <laughs> no. I think people know that. Um, and when I got my permit, I got it for three years. And then um, as long as there are no violations, it sort of works like this, except nobody comes out and inspects. Okay. And technically, because I'm an owner, if I wasn't a good owner, I, you know, right. you need someone to come out and look at, at what I have to make sure that it's meeting, you know, I don't have any code violations, it doesn't smell bad, and that things are being kept up. Um, but we felt like it was a long enough period of time where it wouldn't be a huge burden on staff. And I don't think there are an exorbitant amount of backyard hen applications where it would consume a huge amount of time for staff. So does licensing then, main, or like Phil Henderson's office, maintain the licenses for hens? I forgot how I do that. Okay. I just have to, you know... So we already have a system in place for maintaining the licenses as they are requested and granted. Yes, we just system. don't have a system for inspection. So what I would ask also then is if staff can give us some estimate just of the resources required based on the number of licenses we have now or permits we have now, what resources would be required to do an every three year inspection? I'm guessing it would be minimal. Well, we'd have to kind of look at the number of applications currently, and that would be something. If all of a sudden there was this flood of hen applications, then we'd have an issue. But um, if there is just a very small number, it shouldn't be significant enough to really alter anybody's workload. And Aaron, I asked you this earlier, but I want to just uh, make sure that I'm clear. This is for hens only, not for roosters, correct? No roosters. Yes. All right. No roosters necessary. I do have one comment in regard to Jim's question. Um, I can't speak to the 100 feet, but I can tell you we came up with 25 feet because most older neighborhoods east of 635 have 25 foot fronts. And if you live in a neighborhood where there's only 25 foot fronts in shotgun housing, you would not be eligible under this current ordinance to have hens in your backyard. And it is sort of the whole concept behind um, urban farming and it tends to be the poorer population that would want to be able to feed themselves that um, would be interested in this, that live on these 25-foot front lots. So that's where we, we didn't just come up with this arbitrary number, just so you know from our perspective. Oh, I, I don't know how the 100 feet came about. I don't either. Yeah, so I'd like to know too, but I just wanted to let you know what, how we got to 25 feet. Well, and you said that you had reviewed some other cities or some other ordinances, mm -hmm. and you felt that these proposals were in line with or consistent with other cities. Would that be correct? Yeah. Um, cities vary some, but for example, Manhattan requires 25 feet from an adjacent structure. Um, City of Lawrence says you can have one chicken per 500 square feet. Um, Roland Park says 10 feet from the property line and 40 feet from adjacent dwellings. And those are all places with a lot more space than we have. Um, and then the bigger cities are several of them had 25 foot setbacks. I, I don't have the list of the bigger cities now, but I can I can get it to you if you'd like. Yes, ma'am. A um, couple of questions um, with regard to the applications. Uh, applicants shall be given an information sheet. That's a good idea. Who is going to be responsible for giving this information sheet to the applicants? We have a little ad hoc group called Hens and Wine dot County um, with quite a few hen experts on it. I am not one of them, but they would put that together and would um, run it by several people to make sure it's the right information and then would provide it to the animal control office. Oh, okay. Um, I too had a question about, and that's why I wanted to see the 20, what 25 feet was. Mm -hmm. That is a big change from 100 to 25. Coupled with, we're asking for the uppermost limit to be 20 hands, I guess. I don't know if there was a limit before or, or not. But if you get 20 in that distance, 
<clears throat> that could get a little bit noisy, maybe, for someone uh, in an urban setting. So I'm um, not sure about the distance with the uppermost limit Yeah, with that. I, my recollection is that the current ordinance has an uppermost limit, but I'm not remembering what it is right now. Um, and it's, I think it's lower than 20. Uh, hmm. Could I look into that and get back sure. to you? Sure. I, I, I was just bringing I, I will up. say a, a hint at its loudest can get to be about this, the volume of two people talking. So they're, they're much quieter than dogs. Um, yeah. My Correct. concern is, though, that if somebody gets to the uppermost limit right. then, mm -hmm. and that factor is going to be increased, mm -hmm. um, especially if you're looking to decrease the amount of distance from a home, because it's not just the hen owner, mm -hmm. but the the neighbors mm -hmm. that would be that may have a concern. Mm -hmm. um, in section seven one seventy seven. Applicants should consider using bait boxes mm -hmm. to safely poison rodents and vermin. Uh, why not? Why are we not requiring uh, the applicant to use those methods? That was a suggestion from Commissioner Regas. Yeah, there was no. I didn't know if we could force them. I, I would prefer to force them um, to use bait boxes because no matter how clean your property is, mm -hmm. when you're storing feed for yeah. livestock or animals, you're gonna run into at least field mice. Mm -hmm. And um, if your property happens to abut a rail yard, you could end up with a rat problem, which is more damaging. Mm -hmm. And the beautiful part about bait boxes is that um, we have strays in our community, there's no doubt. And some people might like this, I don't. Strays could get a hold of the poison if it's just sitting out, and mm -hmm. then we could end up with you know, packs of dogs that are just mm -hmm. dead mm -hmm. in our community at random spots if everybody has out poison just openly bait boxes specifically target rodents rat and mice mm -hmm. and keep it clean mm -hmm. I would huh. say this would be the opportunity then to make it a requirement <coughs> since we're talking about changing the language yeah. and uh, I just scanned through the current ordinance there isn't an upper limit for hens but they're there probably should be, um, like Lawrence has one bird per 500 square feet. I think, Gail, that's why we chose 20, because there wasn't an upper limit. That's mm -hmm. what I remembered mm -hmm. from our conversation. But I don't think anybody's objecting to, to lowering that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Hens produce, each hen produces an egg a day. Mm -hmm. It's just what they do. So I, can, I would find it hard that any family, any family would need 20 eggs a day. Mm -hmm. So that should give you sort of a point of reference. If you're talking about single family residential housing, I mean, 10 would be generous. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I guess it was just something to look at in combination with, we're asking that the distance from a resident be decreased too, because you have to consider sure. what will happen if somebody takes advantage of being able to go to 20 hands, so. Mm -hmm. Do you want a different number? <coughs> Well, I'd sure. like to just wait. It's just something for discussion along Planning with time. what yeah. Commissioner uh, Walters had already mentioned about okay. the distance. So I think there's some correlation there. I just wanted to hear more about that. Those were just some thoughts I had as I read it. Mm -hmm. At this point in time, what I'll do is uh, pass that over to Mr. Criswell and ask Mr. Criswell to take the proposed changes along with the notes that he's taken here tonight advance those to planning and zoning, and then once they've had a chance to review it, they will bring that item back to us for reconsideration. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. <clears throat> and the final item on our agenda tonight is under outcomes, and it is uh, a discussion again of open data and the capacity issue. Uh, to frame this discussion, um, Mr. Cooley and several others were here at our January meeting, and they talked about some of the data that we collect as a government. We collect large amounts of data. We store those data in all sorts of various databases in various locations, file cabinets, desks, and what have you. And we talked about the beginning of opening that data. Opening meaning bringing the data together in an easily accessible place so that our staff can 
find it for commissioners, find it for themselves, find it for reporting under release of information requests, and allow us to solve problems to, uh, with those data. And after that last meeting, if you may remember, Mr. Cooley had presented a, a report to all of us that he emailed out where he'd kind of started to wrap his brain around the complexity or the, the issues that were uh, with us, the barriers and challenges to opening our data, the fact that we have many different data systems, the fact that it takes quite a bit of UG staffing um, to access all of those various locations, the fact that some of that data is not public, it is private data, and we need to be concerned about that. Um, and at the end of that, he had some strategies that he had suggested. One, that we begin small. Two, that we maybe develop groups within the UG of people who either gather or access those data so that they could start to give input. And then he recommended that we document what data is opened for use beyond its primary purpose. And he suggested at that time that maybe we could drive some of that discussion with what data would be important for us in our roles to be gathered? What data are our constituents asking for in terms of all the various data that uh, we collect? And then the other discussion that came up was what additional resources might be necessary to open and gather these data? And so the mayor had wanted us to bring back a conversation tonight, and I believe uh, Mr. Cooley, you can be part of this conversation if you'd love to come on up here um, and get some direction from you and from staff in terms of where the bottlenecks are for gathering data, what resources it would take for gathering data, what policies it might take for opening those data, and how we as a committee and we as a commission can help you in your evolving role of opening our data? Um, well, uh, what was the first question? We'll start with that one. <laughs> so the first thing I think would be in terms of, well, what are the current bottlenecks that you run into? What are the current barriers to gathering or opening our data? What resources, what policies could help overcome those barriers? It First off, I want to want to say you attributed all of that to me. Um, I want I want to extend <laughs> my thanks to staff. We actually had a, a you had challenged us in January um, to have a, a brainstorming session with with staff, and that's what we did. So so that was my summary of staff's recommendations or okay. staff's comments. So I don't want to take full credit for it. Um, there were quite a few people that had some good ideas that that, that went together there. Um, as far as bottlenecks, things that that we're facing with. Um, the, the, there's certainly the resource issues. Um, y in, in your and I discussion, um, uh, you know, of, of that document I sent to you, um, you very clearly stated that that resources were an issue. You know, just like they are anywhere in the UG. Um, but being able to pull th things off of their, their daily or operational tasks to put something together, um, to, to put it out and publish it, or to, to make it available to other people, is a challenge for us. Um, so, so that's always, uh, you know, in the back of our minds. Uh, if I could interrupt right there. Yes. Resources being personnel resources, equipment and infrastructure resources, <clears throat> or both? I, I, the, the primary one being personnel, you yeah. know, because th that's, that's the one that, that gets hit a lot. But um, infrastructure, as far as uh, software, hardware, you know, network capacity and those kinds of things, um, that's always uh, going to, to, to be an issue. Um, other bottlenecks would certainly be um, the, just the, the knowledge of staff. Um, you know, we, we have a very um, uh, reactive uh, idea of open data. Um, it's, it's only been in recent years, uh, you can attribute to the, the Obama administration the idea of open by default, which is a, which is a far more proactive um, idea or approach to open data and for so many years in Kansas um, you know and, and even with recent um, discussions with uh, you know I've seen from other counties and cities in, in Kansas they have a very uh, reactionary approach to to data requests um, it's it's a public record and it's in 
you know, I'm the custodian of it, and you have to come and request it from me. And, and you know, that's just, you know, the way our, our attitudes are. So we need to shift our, our internal culture, and I don't think there's a great resistance to it in our organization like I've encountered maybe in some of the other cities and counties in Kansas. But um, it's just a different way of thinking about things. You know, some, some people ask, the, the, the question comes up, you know, you know so, so, so what if we open it up? You know, um, I look at it as a very freeing uh, aspect of if I put the data out there, then uh, I don't have to fill a request. I don't have to respond within three days to let them know that I, whether I can or cannot fill this request um, in, in those kinds of aspects of the open records law. It's out there by default. They can go and get it. It's a little bit of self-service. Um, you know, if somebody needs a, a more guided or focused report, we can certainly do that. But, uh, you know, we would prefer to have people uh, internally and externally getting the data better. Um, move on maybe to, to a, a different question. Um, you know, the, the, the bottlenecks, uh, it's just we need to move forward. Um, we need to pick some data sets and put a, put a, a flag in the sand and, and move forward on some of them and get more of them out there. And I think that by putting them there, we'll see utility in them. Um, and that flag in the stand, sand should be for something that you know, has an intended use today. If there's a, a pet project have, somebody has and there's a data set that, that would be ideal for supporting that project um, or, or an interest in the community or, you know, among organizations in the government, that may be a, an ideal thing to, to focus our efforts on rather than us just picking everything. Um, the other the other thing to, to move forward on, the, the bottleneck, I think, is just understanding all the data that's out there, um, you know. I admitted in January that we were all very surprised uh, just with the handful of things that we talked about at that meeting. Among staff, we were surprised of, wow, there's a lot of things that is very readily accessible. So, You know, and, and for the benefit of everybody else on the committee, uh, okay, I'm kind of a geek. I, I look into this stuff. But uh, a lot of what you showed us, and it was marvelous data, um, and Mr. Cooley, is, along with some of our other staff, are gathering together those lists of, of uh, web addresses and sites that demonstrate all the data we're currently gathering and that are currently available to anyone to access. Uh, data about parcels and land, data about taxes and real estate, data about code enforcement, data about crime statistics and things like that. But what struck me as I looked at all those websites was they are all in some sort of a report format. They're a report that's generated and displayed and nobody actually gets the raw data underneath. And there are those in the open data movement who would say it's not open unless it's right. raw, unless I can take it and not do your report with it, but do something else with it, put this together with that, create something on my own. So... Hey, just to, to back that up, it, when, when you, we had Rebecca Williams from the Sunlight Foundation come here and some of the questions that they were given to her is, is you know, the things that she had talked about in truly opening up a data set is it should be machine readable, which means that it's in a fairly you know, list format like you're mentioning, a, a table, a, an Excel spreadsheet, a CSV file. Um, the, you know, if you don't know what those are, it's okay. It's, 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 a, it's just a big list versus drilling into an individual record that's, that's nicely formatted and presented for you. It allows you to drill in and, and, and do your own analysis of it. Um, the other aspect would be is if we would expose some of that data through APIs, which is an application programming interface, which is for the geeks. Uh, the, the key word to remember there is interface. It allows somebody else to take their program application interface with ours. Um, so those are two options that are available with that. Uh, the, the one of just publishing raw tables is the easier. Uh, so. And I guess there's actually a, a news story just today. I saw USA Today has a story that the government is about to destroy $1.2 billion worth of ammunition. And there is a speculation, at least in this story, that some of that ammunition from Department A could have been used by Department B, but their computer systems don't talk to one another. And so Department B didn't know that Department A had excess in this particular kind of situation. And certainly, we probably run into the same thing, where we keep all of our various data systems and one department may not have data from another department easy and on demand. Right. Would that well, be accurate? Well, th th there's that, and then there's the idea of duplication. Of one department will be maintaining a set of records in another department because they have their own operational needs. Uh, they do it themselves. And because their systems don't talk or integrate well, 
um, they just go about and do their business in, in their own, you know, in their own world. Um, you know, that, that, that happens uh, more than we would like, but, you know, th there's those kinds of things uh, that those efficiencies can be gained um, by uh, capturing the data once and then letting multiple people use it. From your perspective, what could or what would be the highest priorities uh, that we as commissioners might be able to give you in terms of direction, information, support that would help open the door to this whole open data initiative? I, I think uh, a clear ask of, of we would like to see X, uh, something like that. that. That gives us something to move towards. Because otherwise, we're, staff is in this world of, of this idea of build it and they will come. Um, and, and that's a, a wonderful idea for a Kevin Costner movie, but, um, you know, we're, we're stuck out here, you know, thinking that we're hitting the mark. And if, if you tell us specifically, I'd really like to see this data opened up so that we can try and ask these questions or, or I have these questions, can you open up some data or find some data that would help support an answer to those? Um, that would be uh, kind of the best guidance. Because uh, otherwise, we'll go about it from the aspect of doing an inventory, uh, you know, using our own knowledge to, to pull together things that we know are, are you know, commonly requested things. And, you know, that's what we'll open up first. But if there's a, certainly a, a area of the community we want to support or a project or an activity um, or a set of questions we want to answer, uh, then let's, let's ask those questions and, and let's try and focus our efforts there. So then we should pass along to the entire commission a request from you to identify those data, whether it be budget data, code enforcement data, property tax data, land data, whatever data might be most important in terms of thinking through and solving problems, right. we should direct those to you. Right. We can certainly do that. Yes, ma'am. Clarification. Um, you mentioned some of the applications that Mr. Cooley had brought to us in January. Those are already available. Correct. Um, and does the public, the, the list that you talked about, how will that be made available? Is that something we can easily do? Is that already on the website? Because uh, I don't even remember how to access all that stuff. And I know I was amazed at what was already available. Mm -hmm. So where are we with that part of it? That is in the works. Uh, our our uh, public information office that manages our, our website maintenance, they, they've gone through some staff transitions. I know that, that our, our web developer, our web master, mm -hmm. left us uh, back in December, and they've recently hired somebody new to support that role. And with that role, they're looking at um, pulling a lot of things together. Uh, new, I think they're talking about a new face to the website and everything like that, as well as pulling those, those resources together that, that we've talked about, as well as some other resources. Um, you know, th things like go here to pay your taxes. That's the thing. You know, putting, putting all those online interactions on okay. one page, um, you know, uh, pay, pay a bill, pay a fee, pay a, a tax, those kinds of things, as well as, you know, look up a, an address, look up a crime there, look up uh, code enforcement, that kind of thing. So that's coming along, and they're pulling that together, so okay. it, it, it'll happen. Okay. And I'll be happy to let you know when, <laughs> when we get something. Okay. Well, the other thing that I just heard in this exchange was about information internally. Who is our target market? I was thinking and listening to all this that our target market is the user, is the, you know, uh, the citizenry out there. Mm -hmm. I wasn't looking at it in terms of internal needs of the UG. So we've got if more than one target market. We, we, we do. And if you look at, at you know, some of the things that the Sunlight Foundation was, was commenting was that, that the biggest benefit isn't necessarily that you sent this table uh, out there for the community to use. It's for the other staff are now very, you know, it, it's very easy for them to, to access and get to the data and, and use it for, for, you know, something beyond its original purpose. They, they've you know, that, that original department has gained value from it, but now somebody else is, is getting value out of it as well. So they're, they're creating more value than they originally captured with it. So as a commissioner, I'm not sure that I would know how to help you 
get information from another department, I would think from the internal users, they would be in a better position to say this is the data that we want to have access to. Well, I would turn that around and I would say what might help you, and I'll, I'll reference some of the databases that are already out there. So if you go to LandsWeb, which is our online map. Real, uh, that online real estate. Online real estate. So it's really cool. You can zoom in and you can see parcel boundaries and you can get parcel numbers. And if there's a vacant lot on the corner, I can find out the parcel number. Oh, except I'm not smart enough to find any more information about that parcel in that website. So I write down the parcel number and then I jump over to the appraiser's website. And then I can find out who owns it, the tax status, all those types of things. Oh, but wait. Coded violations aren't on that website, they're over on the NRC's website. So right off the bat, I know that I would love to be able to look up one parcel in one spot and find out tax status, code violation status, maybe a report of crime in the neighbor, I don't know. I'd like to be able to go to one spot and not have to back out and go back into three different databases that all operate differently and they all ask for different things. Um, and that's just, so, anyway. <laughs> Sorry. But I mean, will there be an opportunity for the internal users to give some guidance or direction as to what they want to see? Because there may be things mm -hmm. internally that they would like to see. So that would be then a second piece would be for you mm -hmm. to then poll internally among departments and among staff. Mm -hmm. as I, to I think that would be part of our kind of overall inventory okay. of what's okay. there. And, and, and maybe that's it, is, is that, that the, the commission or the, the mayor give uh, direction that, that, that we move forward. I mean, there's, there's a great document on, that the Obama administration put out on uh, directive on open government. And it has very clear guidelines on, on what the Obama administration expected from federal government um, when it comes to open data and op open government. And, you know, gave them deadlines saying that in 90 days you will do this. In 120 days we expect to have, you know, a list or an inventory of these things. You'll provide this on the on the internet. And it, it's a it's a very good guideline, you know, template uh, of a document. It was well thought out. Um, you know, something like that would be would be helpful. Um, my only uh, you know request with that is that that you know uh, be reasonable. Uh, because it, it would be a, a resource, uh, you know, th there could be resource issues by giving a very strict directive like that. So um, we, sh we can think about it and we can put something like that together. So. so to move forward from here, then we will direct to all commissioners a request that they think about what data or collections of data, what reports would be valuable and help them do their, their job. Mm -hmm. or, or their constituents maybe ask exactly. them about. You will poll internally, employees, staff, departments within the unified government, ask the same question. What data, what reports would be helpful in, in doing your job? And then you'll bring back to us recommendations for, more specific recommendations for funding or needed policies okay. that would enable us to move forward. Is that right. fair? That's fair. Any other comments, questions? Thank you so Thank much. You. I'll have a list. <laughs> Very good. All right, that is the last item on this uh, committee agenda. This meeting is adjourned. We will, um, I'm going to allow five minutes in between meetings, so we will reconvene economic development and finance at about, what's that, 553? That's a good question. That's another reason.